That's right. That's right. You made that happen. You made that happen. And as of now, I think not only did you go and serve last Sunday some 40, nearly $40,000 that you gave that we distribute among these schools and given to the superintendents next Sunday on Educators Sunday that Sean mentioned. Last Sunday, Serve Sunday, five churches. Remember, last year it started with us, one church. This year, four other churches joined us to some capacity. Over 1,300 total people mobilized in 32 schools in two counties, weeding, mulching, painting, cleaning, numerous other projects completed. One great God was glorified through your service. Yesterday in Columbia, we partnered with a ministry called One Generation Away with Chris Whitney. We distribute food to needy folks. 20,000 pounds of food yesterday, 20,000 pounds of food given to 275 families equates to 890 people served with over 100 volunteers, many of those from our campuses both here and mostly from Columbia, and God was glorified. By the way, you, you may not remember that today is the third anniversary of our campus in Columbia, and God is blessing that ministry greatly. Your willingness to, to give and to support and send missionaries to a campus south of us, they are building community in Columbia. God is doing a great work. We are community builders. We are community builders. What is community? Community is common unity. We desire to have community, to a common unity with the community in which we live, with the schools and the workplaces and the neighborhoods, so that we, we desire healthy relationships and partnerships with everybody around us. The Bible says a good name is better to be desired than great riches. We want to have a good name so that we can care, so that we can love, and so we can share. And when God opens the doors, and He does, we present the gospel at every opportunity. This morning, we're in a new series for a few weeks, Community Builders from Nehemiah. So I hope that you have your Bible with you today, either your electronic copy or your hard copy. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1, please. Today's message is entitled, Have a Heart That Cares. Have a Heart That Cares. All right, if you found Nehemiah, it's in the Old Testament. If you're in Psalms, go to the left just a little bit. If you found it, say, got it. Got it. You guys are good like sword drill people. You're fast. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Some people, cousins, come all the way to Susa, Persia, a long way from Jerusalem, and they bring a report. And verse 3, here's the report that to Nehemiah. Those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. That's Nehemiah. I cried for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's do just that right now. Lord, we, we pray right now that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, we have felt your presence in powerful ways already this morning. We have worshipped. We have, we have taken communion together. We have prayed for our nation and, and the world, those who hurt because of storms and tragedy. And God, we pray that you'd teach us even now from your word. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Fill me. Holy Spirit, even now, for this privilege, I need you, Lord. Lord, if anything of value is going to be said or heard or remembered or acted upon, if anything of value will happen, it's going to be by your Spirit. Let it be so. So be it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the natural question, what does it take? The natural question we ask, what does it take so that all of us might be community builders? That we really might be out there active 
in our neighborhood and in our schools and in our workplaces, at the ball fields, at the grocery store, that we might be building community with others. I'll give you three words today, very simple. Jot them down if you want. First word is compassion. We've got to have compassion. They told me how bad it was in Jerusalem. That's what I, Nehemiah says in verse 4. He says, I heard these things. I sat down and I wept. And for days I mourned, I fasted, I prayed before the God of heaven. The walls are broken in Jerusalem, and the people are vulnerable. The walls are broken, and the people are vulnerable. Man, when you have city walls, we don't have city walls today, but city walls are for protection, to keep the bad people out, to protect the good people. And yet, there in Jerusalem, the walls have been unbuilt and unkept and devastated and in ruins for decades. For over a hundred years, the people of God in Jerusalem were there open for attack. Verse 17 of Nehemiah 2 says this, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and it will be no longer a disgrace. This city is unprotected. And because it's unprotected, the people of God, the city of God, is unprotected. As a result, when Nehemiah hears this report, he's filled with compassion. Compassion. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. I cried. Now, every time you study God's Word, you learn something new. Now, I want to tell you something I learned this week that that some of you Bible scholars know and just knew. I didn't. I'm not a scholar. Let me tell you this. Israel was lorded over by Babylon 605 B.C. Israel actually paid a tribute to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and they quit paying that tribute, tribute of tax from one nation to another so that they won't beat them up, you know. And one of the kings of Israel said, I don't pay that anymore. So Nebuchadnezzar says, oh yeah, he come over there and he whipped him, 605. So that begins the captivity, the exile, if you will, 70 years. Over 10,000 Jewish people were taken to Babylon. That's over 900 miles away, away from home. Those who are left are in the ruins of the city. The city walls were destroyed in 586 B.C. That's when Daniel... And the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken over under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. And remember, they said, give us fruits and vegetables and waters. We don't have to have the rich delicacies. And after a period of time, they were actually smarter, wiser, and better health. And they rose up. Then somebody did the trick and made the statue. They didn't bow down to it, so they were thrown in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like it, but he had to keep his edict. He had to keep the command that he made. They lived. Jesus himself stood in the fire. Now, that's all taking place during that captivity. Persia has a king named Cyrus the Great who comes along and defeats Nebuchadnezzar in 538 B.C. I'm getting to my point. It's amazing. When Cyrus defeats the Babylonian king, the Medes and the Persians, that's Cyrus the Great. They're even more west, east. They defeat Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar loses rule. That's 538 B.C., Cyrus has a heart toward the Jewish people, and he sets the captives free. They migrate back to Jerusalem, 538. Here's the point. Nehemiah, I always assumed, was part of the exile that left, or children of the exile that left and came back. Nehemiah doesn't take place until 445, 444 B.C. Cyrus, there's two more monarch kings. There's Xerxes, and then Cyrus, you'll read in the first verse of chapter 2, served King Artaxerxes. Here's the point. God put in the heart of Nehemiah a love for a city where he'd never been and for a people he'd never met. Isn't that something? I always just assume he's part of that or the children of the exile. Oh, yeah, mom and dad lived in Jerusalem. He's a hundred. What is that? That's 120 years removed. Here's the deal. Nehemiah wasn't even born when the Israelites went back in 538. He had no connection with them. And yet God put on his heart a compassion. He sat down. He was so devastated. He sat down. Couldn't stand his feet. He wept. When's the last time any of us wept for somebody else? 
When, when, have we really gone in our closet and wept for those who have lost everything in, in Harvey in Texas, Louisiana? Are we weeping now for those in South Florida right there, Key Biscayne, Key West, the West Coast? Have we wept lately for a neighbor who doesn't know Christ, whose eternity would not be heaven should they die today? Friends, I have to confess, I haven't done a lot of weeping lately for anybody. Nehemiah wept. He's filled with compassion for days. It didn't quickly go away. He didn't say, oh, well, I'll get over that for days. And here's a key. He let his pain turn to prayer. The reason Nehemiah had compassion was because God had compassion. Any compassion that you and I have is not man-made or self-made or self-willed or of the flesh. It's because God gives us a compassion. Friends, the reason we care for people is because God cares for people. And what God cares about, we care about. What God's concerned about, we're concerned about. Compassion. A million cars have been lost. 50,000 houses are more devastated. 100 roads are still closed in the Houston area. And, and all we've talked about, how about the vacation islands? Some of you have been to them, totally wiped out. Do, do we have any concern for any of them? Are we just very comfortable in Williamson and Murray counties with our dry, our nice roofs and nice cars? And this morning when we got up, some of us, we had to make the very difficult decision, should I choose this shirt or one of other 25 shirts on my rack? And some people this morning woke up that said, I guess I'll wear this shirt because it's the only one I've got anymore because I lost it all compassion and and ladies and gentlemen I haven't I haven't even yet touched the spiritual side of it that's all physical and it's important people hurt but when's the last time I had compassion for somebody who's broken spiritually and far from God but having compassion is not enough Following compassion, ladies and gentlemen, friends that are watching by live stream, i got to tell you that having compassion is not enough. We've got to let that compassion turn to conviction. We've got to be convicted in our hearts that I can't sit and watch and do nothing. I've got to pray. We're doing that. I've got to give. I hope we'll do that, and some of us are. And, I, and if God provides, I've got to go. If, if I can go on a relief team with a disaster relief team, I need to go in the months or weeks or months ahead. Nehemiah has conviction, and he lets that pain turn to prayer. He begins to pray in verse 5. Great and awesome God, our O Lord God of heaven, who keeps his covenant, let your ear be attentive, verse 6, and your eyes open to hear the prayer that I'm praying to you this day. He begins to be convicted that something has to be done. Verse 11, Nehemiah 1, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today for granting him favor in the presence of this man. That's the king. I was the cupbearer to the king. Just as his pain moved to prayer, his compassion turned to conviction. The Lord convicted his heart to do something about the situation. God often gives us compassion for a person or a people or a location or a situation so that compassion can then become conviction over that matter. And then we make a plan to do something about it. It's easy to sit up here and say, oh, I'm sorry for them. Oh, wow, you know. But what will God stir in our hearts so that we might effectively do something about it? And, I'm, and, and absolutely, we should be concerned about Texas, Louisiana, Mexico, Florida, and be participatory in that. But people are broken right across the street from you. People's lives are in ruins. Oh, they got the house, they got the car, they got the suit, but inside they're empty. And they can't say it, but they're really begging somebody to care. And then have conviction to go over there and love them. Not come over there wagging a finger. Come over there with a listening ear and a tender heart. Are we involved in that kind of ministry because we're responding to the compassion of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit? At TSC, we have a conviction to be in our community building people in the name of Jesus Christ. 
compassion, conviction, and the third, courage. It's not easy. It takes courage to do this. In the last verse of chapter 1, Nehemiah, I'm about to go in front of King Cyrus and say, I'd like a, a, a long sabbatical. I want to leave and go back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2, verse 1. He's there before Artaxerxes. Verse 2, why are you so sad? It can't be anything but a broken heart. Verse 3, may the king live forever. <laughs> I hope I live a long time too. Uh, why should my face not be sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Nehemiah is in captivity. Remember that. Nehemiah is a servant to the king. Never lived anywhere else. He's in the king's palace. He ate from the king's table. He's about to risk all of that and ask to permission to leave and go. He doesn't know that Cyrus is going to say, no way you're not going. And by, by asking, you're disloyal. I think I'll kill you. This is not a man who knows God. This is a pagan. Artaxerxes, I might have said Cyrus a while ago. Artaxerxes is a pagan king. But somehow there's a relationship there. Now, we need to stop here and say, Nehemiah was a servant, but he wasn't a field hand. When you're the cup bearer, you're not getting up before daylight and going and sweating all day. He, he's not a slave in the fields. The cup bearer most likely was probably, I mean, at least I would be, I'm ruler of probably everybody in the palace. I mean, if you're going to have to eat everything and drink everything before the king has it to make sure he doesn't die, wouldn't you want to know the head chef personally? I would. Wouldn't you want to know the guy not only that makes the wine from the grapes, but the guy who grows the grapes that makes the wine, you know, for the king? So he's probably in charge of everything. What I'm saying, sure, he's a servant, but he's not a pauper. He lives in a palace. He lives on a feather bed. He eats from the king's table. He makes the menu. Hey, I want lobster today. Let me taste it, by the way, before the king gets it. And he's about to leave all of that courageously and travel 900 to 1,000 miles through thieves and, and rocky places on foot 900 miles back to Jerusalem and do a job for a people he'd never met in a city he'd never seen. Courage. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes courage to be actively involved in building lives. Nehemiah was 2,400 years ago. I want to fast forward 2,300 years, and I want to stop about 1904. And his name was William Borden, B-O-R-D-E-N. You may not be familiar with that name, but some of you older folks like me might be familiar with Borden Dairies. Do you remember, don't they have a cow named Elsie? William Borden, 16 years old, heir. By the way, the Borden Dairies in the year 1900 were worth millions of dollars in a day when no billionaire existed. I'm talking about ultra magna, magna wealthy, mega wealthy rather. William's 16, he graduates from high school in Chicago. His parents, in order to expand his worldview, sent him before he, through the summer before he went to college at Yale in the fall, sent him on a world tour. He goes through Asia, goes through China, goes through Europe, and, and while he's there, he comes from a Christian home. While he's there, God pierces his heart and says, God's called me to be a missionary. He's 16, and he's on his way to Yale. By the way, Yale would train preachers and missionaries back then. Doesn't now. Study your Ivy League schools. At least five of them were, were training missionaries and preachers for ministry. Not exactly like that today. And God pierced his heart, and he told a friend, I'm going to be a missionary, most likely to China. And his friend, in response, without thinking, said, what a waste of all of his business acumen, his sharpness, and his wealth. What a waste. And the story goes that in response to that statement, William Borden took his own study Bible and took his pen and wrote two words in response to that, what a waste. No reserves. William Borden, known as Bill, goes to... Cambridge, 1905, no, excuse me, Yale, 1905, and while he's there, God just 
breaks his heart because already it's, it's turning secular. Already it's losing its, its spiritual and Christian vibe. And so he does something about it. He and a friend start a morning prayer Bible study before breakfast. Not two hours, just a short 30-minute time. And it's two guys, then it's three guys, then it's four guys. By the end of his freshman year, there are 150 young men in prayer Bible studies at Yale. At the end of his four-year term at Yale, there's 1,300 students at Yale at the time. 1,000 students were in prayer meetings and Bible studies as a result of William Borden. Hey, that's, that's not all there is. He also, it's been written about him, read his autobiography. He would go down to the red light district. He would go down to the taverns. He'd go down to the places where the lowest of life lived. And he'd pull up the guys who never got sober. And he'd feed them a meal. And he'd share the gospel and share love with them. He went where hurting people were. He was a community builder. When he graduated from Yale, because of his business acumen, his amazing personality, his sharpness, he was... He was uh, Given, uh, by the way, do we have the picture of him? Have you already put that up? I want to see him again. Good looking fella. That's William Borden. Think about this. He was offered multiple high paying executive jobs, even at 22 years old, to he said no to every one of them. And he wrote something else when he turned those jobs down and went to seminary to Princeton. And he wrote something else. The first, the first two words, you remember what he, what he wrote? No reserves. And the second two words that he wrote were no retreats. He was piercing through any opportunity to do anything else. Even though he already had millions and could make millions more, he said no retreats. And he went to seminary. And then he, after he graduated from Princeton, he continued his quest to be a missionary to China. But in China, he wanted to minister to Muslims. So instead of going straight to China, he went to Egypt. He's 25 years old. He wants to study Arabic to minister to Muslims in China. And only a few short weeks after he was in Cairo, Egypt, he contracted spiral meningitis and died. But the story goes, in the back of his personal study Bible where you see the first, no reserves, the second, no retreats. He wrote two more words, and underneath, he wrote, no regrets, before he died. You see, 2,400 years ago, there was a man named Nehemiah who left a palace and went to a broken city because he had no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. And then 2,300 later, years later, there's a man named Bill Borden who had millions and had it all at his fingertips. And he had no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. I wonder if at the end of our days, be it 25, 85, or 105, we would have been able to honestly say about our lives, no reserves, no retreats, and no regrets. Because I was willing to build others for the cause of Christ. May that be said about all of us at TSC. Wherever God leads us, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Be a Nehemiah. Be a William Borden. And be who God made you to be. Let's pray. Nehemiah left the comforts of the palace and risked life and limb to rebuild walls. William Borden left wealth, popularity, and prestige and spent his short life building spiritual community wherever he went. God, could the same that is said of these two men be said of us? That we are builders of lives wherever we go meeting both physical and spiritual needs. God, whatever it takes, call us to our knees to weep and then back to our feet to serve. In Jesus' name.
One Sunday a year is not enough. You and I, we're builders of people. Wherever we live, wherever we work, wherever we play, every day representing Jesus Christ. I love you. You're dismissed. I hope you'll go to a Bible study class right now.